we're ready. rolling. This is an interview at the Comfort Inn, Brooklyn, New York. It is March 19th, 2003, um, approximately 2 o'clock p.m. Uh, the interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Walter J. Kleppheis, full name, Walter John Kleppheis, and uh, my date of birth is 27 April 1926, and I was born in Manhattan, 125th Street and Broadway in New York City. Okay. What was your uh, educational background prior to going into military service? I went to one year of high school in New Paltz, New York. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what do you remember about uh, where were you on the day you heard about Pearl Harbor and what do you remember about your reaction? I remember exactly where I was uh, when Pearl Harbor came. We were hiking over near Williams Lake and on the way home that Sunday evening, we passed the tavern, and a man came out, drunk as could be, and said, I hate to tell you young boys this, but the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor and destroyed many of the ships there. Initially, it didn't mean anything to me, but by the time I got home, I realized that I would probably be, have to go into the service myself. And uh, now what? Uh, well, I realized I'd have to go into the service, probably, in all probability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Okay. Why? I, in fact, Pardon? I, in fact, uh, went in. for one year ahead of time. That is to say, I was uh, too young. Instead of 18, I was 17. So your parents signed for you? No, they didn't. I had to leave on my own, and I uh, was in for about uh, six months, and my parents took action to have me discharged. But then I went in the next year, the year after that, that was 1943, 44, 1944, I went in. And again, they didn't want me to go in that second time, but I, I uh, went in by, by myself. I, I wanted to go into the service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did, why did you pick the uh, Army? Because uh, I knew about, the, they had the paratroopers. And I wanted to be a paratrooper, and you had to be in the army to be a paratrooper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where did you go for your basic training? First time I went down at the. Uh, no, not Fort Austin, in Austin, Texas. Near Austin, Texas. And then uh, the year after that, I went to basic training in another Texas place. And I forget what the name of that base place is. Now, the first time you went, did you complete basic training? We just completed it. And, and so they made you go through basic training twice? That is correct. Wow. Yeah. And the first time I was in the combat engineers, and uh, basic training was combat engineers. And the second time was uh, infantry. I can't think of the name of that military base in Texas where I went to infantry training. Well, it's, it wouldn't be Fort Walters, was it? No. No. I'll think of it after this interview is over and I'm home. <laughs> it was a Fort Sam Houston. I do, but that wasn't it either. Okay. okay. Um, but it doesn't make a, you know, I have to know that. Uh, okay, after, when did you end up going into the paratroopers? Well, after basic training, 
First of all, I wanted to join the Rangers, but they weren't taking any more then, so I went back to my first love, which was the, the, to become a paratrooper, and uh, was in the summer or fall of 1940, 44, yes. I went to the Airborne in Fort Benning, Georgia, a four weeks, very intensified course. Did you uh, jump from planes or just from the tower? Or... No, we jumped from the towers to begin with. Mm -hmm. That was the, uh, that was the towers were the third week, yes, third week was towers. As a matter of fact, one of the towers was come from Coney Island right out here. Yeah. That's where they got that tower. They they dismantled it and took it down to Fort Benning and then re-erected it down there. Mm -hmm. And then the airplane jumping was the uh, last week with five five jumps and you were a paratrooper. Mm -hmm. and everything went well with me and I was. It was just what I wanted. What kind of planes did you jump from? DC-3, civilian name, uh, mm -hmm. C-47, military mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. And what unit were you assigned to? I was uh, shipped overseas after basic training and after vacation or leave of a couple of weeks. And I was I went overseas by the, with the Queen Mary troop ship, converted to a troop ship and landed in Glasgow, Scotland. And we moved, we took a train from Glasgow, Scotland, down to, uh, down to the northern the channel, Southampton, England. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you a Oh, what, the question was, what a parachute outfit was I assigned to? Yes. Okay, first of all, when I got on the mainland, of course, the fighting was still going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to the main the continent. I was sent down to the Vosage Mountains to act as an interpreter. They expected a big push by the French. The French army was there. And uh, I was temporarily assigned to the French we work on special duty with the French Army. But the uh, that big push did not come off. And instead, while they were struggling with the Ruhr, not the Ruhr, but the uh, Battle of the Bulge, and I was shipped up, up north to Belgium and assigned to the 17th Airborne Division but was on special duty uh, interrogating German PWs. Of course, I spoke some German. Mm -hmm. So I was with the 17th Airborne Division throughout that portion of the war. Um, we uh, made one jump across the Rhine River. Okay. Uh, was that called Operation Varsity? That's correct. Uh -huh, okay. It's called Operation Varsity. Uh -huh. I didn't jump with my company. Uh, they insisted that I jump with the G2 section again because I could speak some German and I was supposed to round up the, the Germans and uh, until we could get them to the rear, until a bridge was built across the Rhine River and we could get these PWs to the rear. Uh, but I did jump with the G2 section, but a week later I joined near Munster, Germany. I joined my unit, was assigned to my unit, and I stayed with my unit from then on until the end of the war. What unit was that? 17th Airborne. 17th, Division. okay. Yeah. Um, when you, in Operation uh, Varsity, did you receive much opposition or...? At times, yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it got very hot. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, did you uh, take a lot of prisoners at that time? Yes, we took uh, probably about 2,000 prisoners total. I didn't take them. Yes, right. right. Our division took them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I helped in the processing initially. I helped in the processing of these PWs. Mm -hmm. So your job was as an interpreter and in interrogation? In the first part mm -hmm. of, the, of the Operation Varsity. That mm -hmm. is correct. Okay. Um, when you then went to your unit, the 17th, um, you just served on the front lines, or...? I was a, a uh, rifleman to begin with, of course, but then uh, I was assigned to the first squad, the first platoon of the uh, E Company of the 513th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Now, uh, what was the question again? Well, no, I, I just, well, were you in constant contact with the Germans after that point? Uh, oh, yeah. Con constant combat? Uh, well, yes and no. You didn't have combat every day. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yes, I was assigned to the unit. I stayed with the unit after that. And, uh, well, we just got a lot of prisoners. I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. uh, one interesting group of prisoners we took, there were about 200 of them. We uh, were advancing through Munster, Germany, and we, we started to receive a lot of shelling. And uh, I was with a company commander then, and the company commander told all of us to follow him and he went into this cathedral to escape the shelling. And when we were in the cathedral, a young German priest came over, a minister came over and wanted to know if anybody spoke German, so I said, I speak some German. And he said, uh, he said, uh, we have some prisoners down in the basement. We have some German soldiers down in the basement and they would like to give up if that's possible. He said, you don't, you don't shoot the Germans, do you? And he said, no, not unless they deserve to be shot. What's, what, where's the basement and how many do you have? Oh, there's only a few, he said, and he took me to the basement. And as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, the basement was full of Germans. It turned out there was about 200 there. Wow. <laughs> were they all from the same unit? That... No, they were from different units. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started off as a, with the company as a uh, as a uh, rifleman, but then uh, the squad leader gave me the machine gun, an A6 machine gun, and then I, until the end of the war, I carried that A6 machine gun. I was a machine gunner. And so what was your rank at that point? Private. Wasn't even private first class. It was just a private. I didn't make private first class until we shipped to the United States. Uh, I made uh, PFC, mm -hmm. private first class. Now, when you marched those 200 prisoners to the back, back to, to camp, uh, did your group receive any sort of citation for that or, or anything? No, they didn't, but they should have. Mm -hmm. I think that we were probably, our company probably captured, because of those 200 prisoners, uh, we probably captured more prisoners than any other company in the, the division. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing at that, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, after that, um, did, were you in occupied Germany, or...? Yes, uh, we went down to the Ruhr pocket. The British relieved us up near the Munster area, and we went down to the Ruhr pocket. That's Essen, Bochum area, the industrial area of Germany. And uh, didn't take long to finish up the pocket, ca capturing kill all the Germans there. 
and uh, then after that, what did we do? After that, I was assigned to the the, the 13th Airborne Division at about that point, just before we came back to the States. And uh, was, I was picked out as one of the persons to go to the Japanese theater of operation. 13th Airborne Division was going to go to Japan to finish up the war there. And uh, I was assigned to that division. Meaning I didn't have as many points as uh, a lot of people did. They went, went on a point system. But also I would have been gone there in any case because I would have volunteered for it until the war. I wanted to stick with this war until the very end. Mm -hmm. So I did go to the 13th Airborne Division, 517th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And there I was uh, assigned as an assistant squad leader. And by the time we got back to Fort uh, Assembly Point was Fort uh, Benning, Georgia, no, Fort Bragg. And uh, I was assigned to, to, to go, go you know, as assistant squad leader, that's what it was. And then I went to a non-commissioned officer school and became a sergeant. That was, of course, when we were in the middle of the Atlantic coming back, the war in Japan <coughs> ended. Japan gave up, so we didn't have to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. um, what was your, uh, what were your feelings when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? We were all very sad to hear about that, and uh, incidentally, I was back at, I had been in a temporary assignment on the PW, not a PW, but a slave labor camp, and I, we were trying to keep the peace in the slave labor camps, and because I could speak some German, why well, again they assigned me to that job, and I was a private, and while I was doing that work, it was, uh, we got the news that Roosevelt died, and uh, I felt very sad, and so did everybody else, and the uh, Russians, slave laborers, put up a big, huge sign, and they painted a picture of Stalin on it, and a picture of Roosevelt painting. It was beautiful. Did I get lost? No, no. Where was that camp? <laughs> that was in 40, which is just north of the Ruhr district. The, the Germans had these PW, not PWs, uh, uh, workers in the industrial area of the Ruhr, the Ruhr industrial area, like I said, mm -hmm. the city of Essen and what have you. So they, they built a bunch of these camps around that, in it and around it. And there were many of them. We had one, I had one, I was sent back for, to keep the peace at one. The colonel told me to, don't assume management, just keep the peace. Well, these Russians would fight one another, and the many ethnic groups in Russia, we had all of those, problems of these ethnic groups in this camp. And every camp had the same situation, so they had a big moving day where they moved all of the Russians. Okay. Yep. Uh, in this camp, um, these were all Russians? No, they were uh, people from Eastern Europe, for the most part. Previously, there had been Frenchmen there are a lot of French, uh, and, uh, Dutch, Belgium, 
and uh, the Russian camp. Come in. Inga. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. May I come in? Come on yeah, in. Have a seat. Yeah. Oh, oh. We did it. Let's see. Who's who's? Okay. So um, by the time the camp. You, by yeah. the time you were in the camp, then it was mostly Russians left. Though? No. Well, it was overall most of those people who were working there were Poles and Russians. Uh -huh. But we had many other nationalities, uh -huh. the Hungarians and what have you. Now these people would just, we couldn't keep the peace. Every morning we'd have a meeting that would last three or four hours, and uh, they they couldn't agree on anything, uh -huh. and they were scrapping and fighting all the time. So they decided to shift these people, put all of the Russians in our camp. Now I had the, all of the Russians. And uh, the Italians in another camp, well, they, uh -huh. they, they, they were releasing Italians at that point. Uh -huh. The French were being released too. The war was over for them. Those uh, uh, labor camps weren't. They didn't have any use for them anymore. Uh -huh. And they were, majority of them were forced to do that work. Mm -hmm. Some of them were volunteers, by the way. About really? 40, yes, about 40 percent of them were volunteers. In any case, going back to you know, whether I had most of the Russians, when they made all of these shiftings and I had the Russians in my camp, but they were ethnic, the ethnic groups, Russians, were fighting one another. Mm -hmm. the, the white Russians didn't like the, uh, were fighting with the with the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians were fighting with the uh, with the other ethnic groups. It just went on and on and on. Now, how did you communicate to them? Well, most of them spoke some German, uh -huh. and then I spoke German and was able to uh -huh. get, get along. Okay. We we under, made one another understood uh -huh. understood one another. I did have in this camp a Ukrainian girl who spoke very good uh, German, and she did a lot of the interpreting when we needed an, an interpreter. Now this camp had both men and women in it? Yes, families. Oh, families. Yeah. Oh. There wasn't a concentration camp. Yes, I, I realized yeah. that. Yeah. There, there were families there. They had the children and the wives and everything. Huh. Not in everybody, but we did have them. Now, how well fed were the those that were interned in the camp? They were very, had been very poorly mm -hmm. uh, fed, but the UNRWA was already there and started to feed them, mm -hmm. supply uh, uh, food mm -hmm. for them. Okay. All right. Um, now I know we just jumped backward. You went back to the United States and went to uh, NCO school. Um, yeah. What was your reaction? Uh, well, obviously it must have been on your way back or before that. What was your reaction to the dropping the atomic bombs on Japan? That happened when we were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. The war ended due to that. Yes. And since we were all scheduled for Japan, after a vacation at home, leave. Uh -huh. We were very happy that the bomb dropped, uh -huh. and then Japan was knocked out of the war. Uh -huh. we, were, we were we were sorry that so many people had to be killed, but uh, we weren't too sorry about it. Uh -huh. um, okay. Uh, after you went to the NCO school, then where you where were you stationed? Uh, still at the Fort Bragg, uh -huh. but uh, there was a uh, decision made by the Department of the Army to test airborne operations in the Arctic conditions and under extreme cold conditions, and it would be in uh, Alaska. This testing would go on in Alaska outside of Fairbanks. Alaska. 
and I volunteered for that. They were looking for volunteers. I volunteered for that. At that time, I was a platoon sergeant. So we spent one winter Arctic testing, made numerous drops, parachute drops, in the extreme cold. We tried different things. How many jumps did you make in Alaska? I would say about ten. It, wasn't, it didn't all consist of just jumping, it consisted of going cross-country, uh -huh. uh, building bridges across the Tanana River up there, ice bridges, and also all sorts of different types of clothing. Now you say ice bridge, what, what's an ice bridge? Uh, you, you build two two berms, two, two walls, and then you get the water from the river into the center of that road. The two walls uh, form the, the uh, side of the road, I see. the berms. Mm -hmm. And the berms you make about three feet high, four feet high, something like that. And uh, that strengthens the ice so that you can run vehicles over it or march over it or whatever. That's a nice bridge. So after you uh, worked, did these experiments with equipment and so on in Alaska, yeah. where you were you assigned? Well, after it was through that, I went back to my old unit, which was the uh, now the 82nd had come back from Europe. And we amalgamated. Our division was amalgamated with the 82nd Airborne Division, so we became, we, I was actually a member of the 82nd Airborne Division. And when we, I returned from Alaska, then uh, I talked with the company commander, the company commander talked with me and convinced me I should go to officer school. So I took the examinations and applied for officer school and was accepted. Went out to Fort Riley, Kansas. Did a, it was called the Ground General School. Six months course. If you were an NCO in World War II, you were, you would be, be able to go to that school if you pass the examinations and what have you, which is what I did. Uh -huh. And after after that, I was assigned to the Japan. Went to Japan and was assigned to an airborne school as an assistant instructor, but also as a uh, Assistant Post Engineer. I didn't do much instructing, but I did a lot of engineering, which was quite a challenge because uh, I had, I was a labor officer along with that job that it consisted of being a labor officer, and I had more than 2,000 Japanese that I was responsible for as a, as a manager. What th things did you do with the Japanese? Well, we extended the runway. It, was a, it had been a Japanese air base, Navy base, and the Americans decided to extend the runways. We did that. We built the bowling alleys. Uh, road maintenance was a big item. And uh, the drainage for the rice paddies, the airport was surrounded by rice paddies, so we had to establish a drainage system, repair the drainage system, and so forth and so on. There was house maintenance, building maintenance. 
Were you married at that time? No. No. Plenty of opportunities, though. <laughs> to get married? To <laughs> get married. <laughs> How long were you in Japan? Well, I went from, uh, from this uh, Machishima Air Base north to Hokkaido to the 31st Infantry Regiment and all told I was there two, two and a half years. And then I left the service. Okay, what, what year was that? Sixty-five or so? Yeah, I'm looking here. Uh, Forty... Forty-nine. Oh, okay. Yeah, the first time. Have we ever discussed this photo? Do you know where this photo was? When uh, that was? When it... Now, um... <clears throat> Did you stay in the Army Reserves or the National Guard? Yeah, I stayed in the Army Reserve. That's exactly correct. Uh -huh. And uh, in the meantime, I've been promoted to first lieutenant. But I stayed in the Reserves, and I applied for and went to the Spartan School of Aeronautics. I love to fly, and I decided to make, rather than make the Army a career as such, I stay in the reserves, but I would uh, learn to f would fly commercially, uh -huh. twin engine and what have you. We can take it up later, but I have uh, uh, information in the, that I brought with me on another person that maybe you might be interested in. Okay. He's, he's dead, but... No, that would be... We could use for your archive. Yes, yes, thank yeah, you. Marine pilot. Okay. Um, so you weren't in the reserve... You weren't on inactive duty for a while... For, uh, yeah, for several years, and the, and the Korean War started. Okay, um, so you were called up for Korea? You, you got it, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> what years were you in Korea? 51, 53. And um, when you ba went back in, did you go back in air airborne or? Yes, I went with the 187 Airborne Regimental Combat oh, Team. Okay. They were in uh, Japan at the time. Uh -huh. Well, they were in the Korean War. Uh -huh. And they had pulled back and went into reserve. And I joined them when they were in re the reserve position. They weren't in the, the peninsula of Korea. They were uh -huh. back in Japan. Uh -huh. I made no parachute jumps with the 187. You didn't? Okay. No, I got there after they jumped. Mm -hmm. So when did you end up uh, in, Korea, in Korea itself? In oh, 52, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, could you describe Two. your experiences then in Korea? Well, that take a long time with all of my hesitation, but uh, I was assigned as a forward observer. I'd been commissioned in the infantry, but uh, they, did, they had surplus of infantry officers in the 187. They were short of artillery officers. And in the ground general school, we had a lot of artillery training. So when they asked me whether I'd like to go to the artillery of the 187, I said, sure. And I was a forward observer most of the time, and sometimes I was liaison officer with some of the foreign armies that were there, like the British, the Turks, the French, and the Koreans. I worked with all of them uh -huh. as a forward observer, uh -huh. in addition to my regular duties with the 674 Field Artillery Battalion, the 187 Airborne Regimental Combat Team. And stories, I can tell you, tell a lot of stories. 
I wore read one about pink pajamas. Yeah, <laughs> I got a couple of those kind of stories. <laughs> Uh, the, the story is, uh, I went uh, assigned to the Korean outfit as a forward observer, and I had to go back to a meeting, and uh, the Korean colonel wanted to move his headquarters closer to the front lines, and the American advisor didn't want him to do that. But the, they got into a big argument, and finally the Koreans said, well, I'm going to do it. And uh, the American colonel jumped up, and I couldn't believe it. He, was, he had pink pajamas on. He didn't, was, he was very non-military, to say the least. <laughs> and I had a hard time to keep from, from laughing. I, I, I would too. <laughs> Um, but there's so many, probably the most important thing that happened to me during the Korean War was uh, uh, a patrol that we had out in front of us, an American patrol that got uh, surrounded early in the morning. And I was on an operation post, OP, overlooking that valley where they were. And the Koreans were trying to surround them and capture them. And my FO sergeant and I, of course, called in the artillery. And we were able to prevent them from being overrun. We were very successful at it. We were firing three or four batteries of artillery and 4.2 mortars all at the same time and keeping track of all of this. It's, for some reason, uh, our minds were functioning beautiful that morning. We were just... So we were shooting and killing the, the uh, Koreans or Chinese, I don't know what they were at this time. Uh, one right after the other one. one Every time we fired a volley, why it seemed like it landed right on a bunch of them. We couldn't miss that that day. That particular person, uh, a particular person that was with that patrol, Corporal Hammond, made radio contact with me and adjusted, told me where to shoot this. Uh, for a period of time, this didn't go on all the time, but for a period of time, he told me where to, sh to move my uh, artillery concentrations to get the most number of, of uh, enemy soldiers. And every time it seems like we fired for effect, why we were right on target. We didn't miss that whole day that we were that I was shooting, and we didn't miss it. The other thing that happened during the same time. Incidentally, at this point. Uh, General Colonel was a colonel at the time, Westmoreland. He became chief of staff uh, later on in years. But he was helping me locate these enemy targets. And also, the Chinese made a push, made a movement of about, there was about a battalion of them from one side of the valley to the other side in front of me and we fired 4.2 mortar smoke rounds at them and two South African Air Force fighter planes with some bombs hooked under it uh, saw the smoke and flew their, they flew their airplanes right over the smoke and dropped their bombs. We hadn't called for any air support. Mm -hmm. and it turned out that they missed the smoke which they were supposed to drop their bombs on, which was up the valley, the Iron Triangle Valley. They dro mi missed dropped them on a uh, 4.2 mortar. And the Chinese, the battalion of Chinese, just turned around and panicked, ran back to their foxholes in the side of their tunnels 
on the side of the mountain. But only one person was killed in that whole operation of ours. Mm -hmm. There were hundreds of the enemy were killed. But uh, of our people, only one person was uh, killed, and that was Corporal Hammond. And he got the Medal of Honor for adjusting that artillery fire so close to him that he was killed by it. Did you ever receive any citation for that action? That was the brown, brown star with the V device. And I got one of those in the European theater, too. That's another story. <laughs> what were you, how did you feel about the uh, Republic of Korean Army? Well, they needed a lot of training. They were still, a lot of them were untrained. But uh, I got along good with them. I made it a point to get along with everybody I worked with. And uh, like I say, I was shooting artillery, artillery fire for them a number of times. And there were some things I didn't like. For instance, uh, the idea of discipline was with a sergeant just beating the heck with a stick. Uh, beating the uh, enlisted man, the sergeant beating the enlisted man. Officers screaming, I never went for that, but mm -hmm. they were coming along very fine. Did you, ever, excuse me, did you ever have any experience with blacks at that time because they were integrated into the military? Was it's good that you asked that question, sir, because we had quite a few blacks that came into our unit. And just one example, we have artillery sections, which is 1105 howitzer, and a section sergeant was from North Carolina, I can't think of his name anymore. He's a real nice, bright young man. We got our first black man in, and he was assigned to that section. And I was in the battery commander's office when the section sergeant requested permission to see the battery commander. That was given, and he came in and reported, and he said, Sir, I just can't live with the blacks. That was the boy from North Carolina, the section chief. Captain Donahue was from New Jersey. And he was, he was, uh, whether they were black or whatever color, didn't mean anything to him. So he talked that section sergeant into letting him be in his unit for, I think it was two weeks. Do everything you can to get along with him for two weeks. And then report back to me if you still, if you feel that you can't live with him for that two weeks then I'll assign him someplace else. But you're a bright man, you're an intelligent man, uh, it's time that you learn to live with other colored people, other people. And within one week, those two were the closest of friends. They'd, they brought the black man in too and explained it to him, but he was an intelligent individual also. He didn't have these animosities didn't carry him around with him. And uh, within one week, they were going on leave together, vacation, mm. and what have you. They were the best of friends. Mm. And as far as the infantry was concerned, we had quite a few of them assigned to, the, to our infantry, and they were all just as good as the white soldiers. We had no problems whatsoever. What did you, uh, how did you feel about the relief of uh, MacArthur by Truman? I didn't, I felt that I didn't know enough about it to, to have any feelings one way or another. Uh, I do remember the thinking that the president is the boss and the final word comes from the president, just as we have now 
the president making a decision which we don't all agree with on war with Iraq. So you left uh, Korea in 53? 53, that's and right. And you stayed in the reserves after that? No, I stayed in the army after that. Oh, you I, stayed did, in the I decided that uh, I had been in long enough I should continue. Mm -hmm. I had, in the meantime, I had applied after the Korean War. I had applied for the uh, Air Force. Of course, I still was my first love was still flying, mm -hmm. but uh, I was turned down because of my eyes, so I didn't go into the Air Force. And I decided to stay in the Army. At least twenty years. When did you uh, retire? In uh, nineteen. Do you remember, Inga? I think you told me 65. 65. You married then. That's why I wouldn't know. Yeah. <coughs> 65. Now, I noticed uh, on the form you filled out, you were in the Special Forces? Yeah. At that point, uh, again, because of uh, my German, they were, they were looking for people who spoke multiple languages. Uh -huh. And... Uh, I just came back from the Korean War, got acquainted with, went to the 82nd Airborne Division down at Fort Bragg, and got acquainted with some Special Forces officers who talked me into, who told me that they were short of all languages, but particularly the German and uh, Russian and Czechos. So I volunteered for Special Forces and was accepted there, took their training, passed, went through their training program without a flying colors, without any problems. And then I was in, in Special Forces until just before the end of my career. And I was, was the 17th Special, no, the, uh, 10 Special Forces in Europe for four years. That's where we are going in November. In November we're having a <laughs> reunion of Special Forces uh -huh. in southern Germany. Uh -huh. uh, now I noticed it said you had a Master Parachute Badge. What does that mean? That's uh, 65 jumps uh, minimum or is it 50 jumps now? It's the highest uh, uh -huh. award for the jumps. You but I have, have a total of 168 jumps. That includes sport jumping. Did you ever have any parachute malfunctions? Yes, I did. I had one I was... Uh, you know where New Pulse, New York is? Mm -hmm. And we decided to put on an air show when I was home on leave. And uh, Bill Colbert was the owner of the airport at that time. And I, w I would make some parachute jumps. So we did this. First one I made, I landed in the Walker River. <laughs> <laughs> Pulled those risers as hard as I could. I couldn't get, get off of that river, and I landed in the water. And now, were you a master parachutist at that point? No. <laughs> I was just a plain, ordinary parachutist. Anyway, uh, so then I changed clothes, because it was all wet. I changed clothes and I went uh, up to do another one. Of course, we'd promised the people to come to this air show there'd be two, two airborne drops, two parachute drops. So when I bailed out the second time, the chute didn't open. And it was a ripcord type chute, not a... Not the military with a mm -hmm. static uh, line. The web on it, yeah. And uh, well, we were about we jumped from about 1,000 feet on that jump, but the chute did not open, and uh, I had to pull the reserves. 
handle on the reserve chute. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I shook, shook it out and it opened up. And that's what stopped me just before I went below the tree line. We don't know what happened to it. But I didn't pack it, uh -huh. although I'm a train trigger. I didn't, I didn't pack it. And then I've heard some clo had some close uh, encounters with, uh, not with the sh well, extreme uh, hard landing falls. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of those. But uh, none, none others that I would say was very, very dangerous. In the military, were most of your jumps with a static line? Or? Yes. Yes, that's right. Hooked up to the airplane. Mm -hmm. But I love parachute jumping too. Mm -hmm. So I made quite a few. Uh, I had my own parachute and my own uh, reserve. I made some at Kingston, New York also at air shows. Mm -hmm. Do you still jump or are you retired I from that? I haven't jumped in uh, quite a few years now. All my children have jumped, and uh, I would still do it, except now I got Parkinson's disease. And I don't, I don't coordinate as good as I used to. Mm -hmm. um, when you retired, what was your rank? Major. I guess we should squeeze in here that, uh, in addition to having. Uh, A German team, I had a Czechish team, Bohemian Special Forces team. All my people were from Czechoslovakia. And then I had a German team for a while. And then I was sent back to Fort Bragg as a Special Forces instructor. So I spent a couple of years doing that. And uh, then an opening came for a so-called hardship tour, special forces type, and that was in Pakistan. Since I was interested in learning more about the, uh, the Muslim religion, why I volunteered for Pakistan and was accepted. I spent two years. What years were those? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Probably 63, 1963 to 65 maybe, or? Let's see, seven, there's no problem. So you never ended up in Vietnam? No, I did not. Let's see, what were we looking for when I... When you were in Pakistan, you said... In Pakistan, that's right. Sixty-two, sixty-three. What did you do in Pakistan? I was advisor to the Pakistan Army. I would many times was on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. I know the area well. Khyber Pass area. And East Pakistan duties included uh, one trip with my Pakistani colleagues to East Pakistan, which is Bangladesh now, mm -hmm. and many other side trips, for instance, to India, Calcutta, Delhi, etc. I became quite well grounded in, in the area. I enjoyed my work very well working with the Pakistanis. 
did you do any jumps with them? Did you train them in jumping or? I did not. Mm -hmm. The uh, type of work I was doing did not include jumping. Uh -huh. Was it like border patrol and so on or? No, no we didn't do that. You might say we were, the closest I could come to it would be commando type of work. And infiltration and exfiltration and other than jumping. But I got to go way up into the Himalaya mountains and such places as an example as Gilgit. Hunza country. Mm -hmm. Did you have some pictures you were going to show us that I could zoom in on with the camera? Well, there's that one this way for this. Okay. I got something I'll give you here. Okay. This is George Duffy, Marine Corps Reserve pilot. He was killed right out here near Coney Island on a golf course. Uh, and maybe you have information. I don't think so. Well, we'll add that to our collection. Now, how about telling us about that photograph there? Well, it's just a... You want to yep, just hold it like that and I'll zoom in on it. That's, that's perfect right there. Now, when did you think that was taken? We decided that was in 49, didn't we? I think I think you did say around 49 or, or so. Or 52, I thought. Yeah. Or 49, I think, yeah. 46 would be 20, 23, 24, 25 years old then? I don't know how old that was. And that bottom picture is you getting the Bronze Star? Yes, and uh, that was for that... Uh, That action where we were so successful with our artillery fire. Okay, got him. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Now you said you're going to go to. Do you go to uh, um, reunions, or have you been to reunions? Quite a few of them. You have. Have you stayed in contact with anyone that you were in service with? Yes. Uh, I was going to mention his name, Ed uh, Haynes, up in Yonkers, who was my platoon sergeant during the Battle of the Bulge period, mm -hmm. and after the Battle of the Bulge, mm -hmm. and uh, very fine gentleman. In fact, I generally say that because I was so gung ho, and he he dampened my enthusiasm. So I say that he saved my life. If I would have done all the things I was going to do, I probably wouldn't be here today. He was a fatherly type. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, he should fill out one of these forms too. Okay. Sure. I could give you one to give to him. Would you do that? Yes. Yep. Okay. Was just what I was thinking of. All right. Now here's a, a humorous little article that I wrote, the battery commander's rest gets abruptly disturbed. Did I give you that? No, you didn't. Okay, I'll okay. give it to you. Okay, okay. Uh, we're going to stop the video now. We're down to the last couple minutes. I last thought. minute, so. Okay. Thank you very much for your video.